I've got two hours to tell you a really lot of things. You won't remember any of them probably. Maybe if you walk out of here and can take away two or three things, it will be really good. I'd like to divide what we're going to do today into four parts. First, you have to suffer along with me by maybe saying a little bit about why you want to know about electric fencing and what experience you have with electric fencing so far. Then I'm going to give you a little talk with PowerPoint, but we're going to spend most of our time looking at some of the things I've brought today and talking about how they work and practicing one or two things and then I'll give you a little test. And the reason that you're going to get a little test is because it helps stick things in your mind. But you can cheat on this test because I'll also have already given you the answers. So that's our plan for today for about two hours. Um, I will tell you that I already this summer changed the way I've done things for a long time. And so you too will find that you'll change everything I'm telling you today to something that suits you a little bit better. But maybe I'll give you, be able to give you one or two bits of information that will help you. Now, I will tell you before I start asking you why are you here and what do you already know, probably maybe even more than I do, I will tell you that my husband and I are one of those kinds of people that, that we, we always still don't know much, but when we started, we didn't know anything. We had a book. We didn't even have a four-wheel drive pickup. We didn't have a horse. This was all pretty long time ago, before electricity. But, but we've learned some things, and I can tell you one thing we've learned, that portable electrical fencing has allowed us to improve the range on three ranches so much that we were able to start with our 40 acre cow ranch, one cow ranch, and work our way up to a pretty sizable outfit for a bunch of people that didn't know what they were doing. And I attribute that a lot to electric fencing and control of grazing. I'll also say that herding works just as well as electric fence. But it's probably even harder to find a good herdsman than it is to learn to use electric fence. So there's more than one way to skin the cat. So why do we, why do we even care about electric fence? And I'll say we're talking today about temporary electric fence. A very small portion of the whole concept of electric fencing because we don't have enough time to talk about everything today. So I'm talking to you specifically about what I do four or five days a week. Now temporary doesn't mean it can't stay up for a long time. Temporary means though that it's designed to be put up and taken down. And when we ranched in Nebraska for a while and we made a mistake there. We had really small paddocks, two or three acres, and we moved frequently, but we put our are a lot of electric fence up as permanent electric fence before we really knew the place. And we swore at that fence for 15 years because if we'd only put up temporary electric fence till we knew the way the place worked, we could have saved ourselves a lot of trouble. So I'm a big fan for temporary electric fence and I've been fighting against my husband, amongst other things, about when it might be time to put in more permanent fence because it takes you four or five years to really learn a place. And when you start fencing, all of a sudden you look at it a different way. So temporary electric fence is a good, not very expensive way to learn about how your place works. And that's pretty critical for time saving. The other thing I mentioned, but I'll give you some numbers now, we ran, have ranched north of Gillette, over in the Sand Hills, and now here on Lodgegrass Creek, which is by far the best ranch we've had. But we feel pretty confident when we tell you that you can increase your forage production about 30% and improve the quality of your range dramatically. 
takes about five years to start to really get that return on your investment. But I believe then, and I didn't bring Ellie along to say yes, no, and I hope she doesn't say no too much, but I believe that even, this is our third summer on lodge grass, and I believe that we can see some changes already. And so it's worth it, I think. Okay, now I mentioned this already, permanent fence versus temporary electric fence, TEF. Permanent fence is made to contain or to exclude. You can make them, st if you make your fence out of the right stuff, you can exclude anything and you can contain anything. Temporary electric fence is a means of communication. A string cannot hold back an animal. A string can't even hold back a deer. It's a way to talk to, to other organisms. And if you're trying to send them the wrong message, you'll get the wrong results. So what is the message that you're trying to send with your electric fence? You're trying to say, we don't want you in here right now. If the animals are, don't have any feed, if they don't have any water, if they're scared, if they've never seen an electric fence before, you're going to have to talk to them for a while before they get the picture. So it's not a panacea. If you want to keep an animal out the first time, every time, you need an electric fence like they put on the jail. And that's not what we do here today. This is a more smoother, kind of gentle way of communicating in a universal language. But I'll tell you the other thing, and if you leave here today and only remember one thing, is that a very bad message to send with temporary electric fence is the fence isn't hot. Because once they learn that, you're fighting an uphill battle. So how is it communicated? How do you communicate with temporary electric fence? You get a shock, just like you get when you are filling your gas tank with gas in the winter and it pops you, or you drag your feet along the carpet and it pops you. It's about the same kind of a pop. It's not dangerous, but it's not pleasant. And even when I know a fence isn't hot, I don't want to touch it. So it works good with people and it works good with animals. Why do you get a shock? You get a shock because you're shorting out an electrical circuit. Now I thought I'd be pretty smart and get on the internet and learn enough about electricity so I could tell you all about it. And what I learned is you can't find a good explanation about electricity. The best I found is um, a little website called, now I can't even remember what it was called, but I couldn't find, it's like mysterious and I always thought I was dumber than everybody because I couldn't understand electricity. But what I learned is nobody really understands it. But we do need to understand that what you're doing in temporary electric fence is establishing a flow of power that works because something interrupts that flow of power, they get zapped and they don't want to get zapped again. But will it electrocute you? Will it really hurt you? No. It's specially made so that does not happen. So the fence is the medium. The shock is the message. It communicates, don't come here right now. But the other thing is, is if you use your electric fence to move animals, when you open the fence, they run. They know. They want into that next pasture. And that's what I use electric fence for, to help animals understand where they need to be. If you try and fence out a stackyard and it's 20 below in the middle of winter, there's no elect temporary electric fence that's going to convince those cows that they don't need that feed. So there are limits to what you can do, and that's why I say you communicate. You're not forcing the animals to do what you want. And it's a universal language. We can, you can speak Russian and I can speak Crow, and we can still communicate when we both get popped by that fence. And that's why it's such a good tool for everyone. We all understand. Now, if you've heard anything about electric fencing at all, you maybe heard that you've got to do planning and make all these paddocks and do all this kind of stuff. That is not true. What you need is you need a plan that is simple. That's what the K-I-S-S -S stands for. Keep it simple, everyone. 
but the plan needs three levels. You got to have an idea of where you want to end up. For example, and that's a strategy, you have to have a strategy. And what's your strategy? Well, most of us want to increase forest pr forage production through pasture division, water improvement, and livestock movement. But some of us want to keep our horses in so they'll graze the, the lawn. Some of us want to keep the neighbor's horses out. I bet that doesn't happen to anybody around here. Maybe we just want to have a little more grass for the animals. Okay, so you need a high level idea of where you're going. Then you need your medium range plan, like what are you going to try and get done this year? And when we started at Lodge Grass, we had three pastures. One of them's 3,200 acres. It's bigger than the first ranch we owned. And it has no interior fencing. Well, we're not going to run out there and put miles and miles of fence all over the place. What we're going to do is we're going to pick one place that by putting a fence in, we have a little bit more control. And a very famous man in, in, in uh, this kind of work name of Alan Savory, he pointed out one day that you put in one fence and you've doubled the control that you have. And so just look at your place and think about how much more control you would have even with one fence. And that's kind of how we went about it so far here in this area. And then you need the operational plan, and that is when are you going to put up the fence, what are you going to use, how long is it going to take, and who's going to do all the work. And I see we've got two workers here in the front row right now, and, and a soon-to-be worker in the back row. And the fact is, is that electric fence is pretty easy to put up. But if you are lazy and you don't do it right, you're not going to get good results. And if you don't follow the rules, of which there are a few, you're going to hate that fence with a passion, and you won't ever use it. And I'll tell you in a little bit what those rules are. OK, so temporary electric fence, what is it made up of? It's made up of twine, a reel to put the twine on, some posts, some insulators, some handles. Hot and cold means the power passes through some kinds of handles, and the power doesn't pass through others. And we'll see these this afternoon some gates for people to, and animals to get through, an energizer, or char, also called a charger, and a ground. And we've had several people mention the word ground today, and that's where the power that flows in a current goes in, literally into the ground and dissipates. That's kind of the end of your fence. Now you say, well, but the end of the fence is right at the beginning of the fence. And that's true, because the ground and the hot come from the charger. And that's where the mystery of electricity is, and that's not what I'm going to talk about today. But I can tell you for sure that if you don't have a good ground, you won't have a good fence. All right, so what's your absolutely 100% necessary equipment? And I said I wouldn't talk any brands or anything, but you need a tester. And I will tell you, if I do recommend anything, get a good tester. And a good tester allows you to test how much power is coming through your fence in kilovolts. And it also, this one's called a smart fix because it also will show you where faults in your fence are. But you have to have a good tester. And it has to read numbers. Okay, if I've heard my husband say once, I've heard him say a hundred times, oh, I'm sure the fence is hot because it popped when I put the screwdriver on it. That will not help you. You have to be able to read the numbers so you can know how hot your fence is. Because remember, you're communicating in a universal language and that's a shock. But if it's a crummy shock, it's not going to communicate very much. And the only way you know, unless you want to touch that fence and see how bad you got zapped, is to read it with numbers. So I'm very strong on saying have a good tester. The second thing you need is you need a good set of pliers. And what you really need is two of them, unless you're the kind of person that never loses anything, which I am not. Good pliers because you're going to clip a lot of twine. And then you need a good hammer. And my hammer is quite old, the one I brought in today. In fact, it's quite elderly. 
but it's called, I call him a sand hammer. That's because inside is sand or something like sand. And when you whack on the post, it, it, it gives a little bit. And that keeps you from splitting the posts that you're going to use. If you use a regular hammer, you'll split the top of your post. And you can use a little widget to set on the top of the post, but it's a gigantic waste of time. So get a hammer, get a tester, and get a set of decent pliers. And don't get those ones for a dollar from the uh, dollar store, because they won't work. All right. Any questions so far? Okay, now I gave you a whole long list of what you probably need in your four-wheeler and you really go fencing. And I'm just going to read through this because it's kind of collateral to what we're talking about today. It's a good idea to have a post pounder. You have to have a post pounder. A screwdriver, and I'll show you why. Vice grip pliers, a wire cutter, and a crimper. T-post clips, a fence stretcher, barbed wire, staple splices, fencing pliers, a regular hammer, a T-post puller, a little saw, a box cutter, spare insulators and lots of them, electrical tape, flagging, gloves, and a trash container. Now, I just wrote out what I carry around in my four-wheeler all the time. And you say, but we're talking about temporary electric fence. Why do you need all this stuff? Well, you ever been four miles from, from, from the shop and found that you've got an, a regular barbed wire fence that's down? And you just don't have any of your barbed wire fence fixing stuff? It's very annoying. Or you get to an old gate and you open it and you can't get it shut because you're a 66-year-old lady and you're not quite as strong as you used to be. If you don't have your fence stretcher, you can't get that gate shut. So it's pretty good to have a pretty good set of supplies in your four-wheeler and not just your essential equipment because you'll regret it. All right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through each of the components of electric fence and tell you a few important things from my perspective about what is useful to know. For example, when we talk about electric fence, I say use polytwine, stay away from wire and tape. And the reason I say that is because you can get a fault in your tape and you can't see it very easily and it won't work and then you'll say electric fence doesn't work all your animals will be out and you'll be swearing me up and down I use polytwine we've tried everything we've tried that expensive horse tape we've tried little light tape we've tried wire thin wire fat wire the wire breaks and it gets tangled up and you've got a mess on your hands you can't fix I like polytwine because it can get tangled but if you get it tangled, you can almost always untangle it. Now that's not to say there's not lots of bad polytwine. In fact, I brought a bunch of examples today and we'll look at them. But the polytwine you want, and when I said this to Evan, he said, really, do you have to buy that expensive twine? My answer is no, you can buy whatever you want. But for me, I say sturdy, as light as possible, but remember that when something hits your twine, it'll break it. And so you want it pretty sturdy. Lots of metal strands it needs, and I'll show you some that looks really sturdy and it's not. And it's stabilized against ultraviolet because if it's not, it's cheap, but it'll also break real easily. When you use electric fence, you should only ever tie one knot. That's a square knot. But if you're like me, it took me 35 years to learn to tie a square knot, so I use a granny knot, and the granny knot will work too. But you only put a knot in your fence when you're tying one piece of fence to another. Never knot on your handles, never knot on your fence, never, or your posts, never knot on anything, just to tie wire together. I'm going to show you today that the rest of the time you want to be using a half hitch. Because why? Because you spend a lot of time with this stuff, and if you're not efficient, you're not fast, and if you're not fast, you won't fence. The twine must move freely along the fence. It's like, kind of like barbed wire. You, everybody's got a neighbor that when he pounds his staples in, man, he pounds them into the post so you can't move, the wire can't move, and then it gets cold and it breaks. 
Same idea with the twine on the insulators. It should move. It's got to give. It gets hot. It gets cold. The animal hits it. It's got to move. So the twine must move freely. It's a good idea to tie like twine to like twine. There's a hundred million kinds of twine out there. And you'll get into a desperate strait and you'll tie one kind of twine to another. And the electric, the little tiny electric guys, they don't care. They'll jump from one kind of twine to the other. But if they have different abilities to resist being hit, uh, resist being stepped on, resist being dragged in the mud, it'll be very irritating. So I try and always use light twine and light twine. And then, if you get on the internet, because I did to look at electric fencing, and you can see stuff on there that is like so unbelievable, you can't even believe it. But in most cases, an animal, if the ground is good, will be fine with one wire. And if you only have one wire, you cut down a lot of pain and suffering on your own part of how much work you're going to do. We've used multiple wires. Heck, when I started, we put up three because the instructions say, put up a hot, put up a ground, put up a hot. And so we did all that, but now we only use one wire. But we have good ground. In Lodgegrass Creek, we've got clay, and clay is very good to pound the, your grounds into. Um, so we never hardly have a problem with fence that's not hot. If you've got a lot of sand, it's a lot harder to make a good insulator. If you've got a different kind of clay like they have over north of Gillette, it's hard to get a good ground. And we'll talk in a little minute about the grounds. Okay, you need a reel. And when, you're, when you don't have very much money, you use the cheapest thing you can find. Now, I understand that. But if you, if you love yourself and you don't want to be angry all the time, I really suggest that you use a geared reel with a guide. Because about the hundred millionth time you've wrapped that doggone twine around the side of your reel, you throw that thing down. Well, you won't, but I know somebody who's thrown that thing down and kicked it. So, so if you have a reel, use a sturdy reel. Don't, you can buy big reels, but when the reel gets full of twine, it gets pretty dang heavy. And so you don't want a too big of a reel. Geared means when you roll it up, it's like a fishing reel. It, 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 it somehow magically winds more efficiently than like when you have a hose reel to reel your garden hose on. And it'll tell you that it's a geared reel. It should have a guide. I already mentioned that. The guide's just like, I mean, it's like a big giant fishing reel is what it is. It has a guide, and that helps the wire go back and forth and go on evenly. And it keeps it from wrapping itself around the edge there, which is pretty dang critical. Then the reel should go, if you're using the end of the reel instead of tying it off, you should put it on a post when you can and not leave it on the ground or, or dangling. And then... Um, the leads to the reel, which we'll talk about a little bit here with the charger, need to be tight and undamaged. That actually goes on the charger page. Okay, what kind of post? Now remember, we're talking about something really special today here. We're not talking about everything about electric fencing. We're only talking about temporary electric fencing. So I'm going to tell you that I think the best for temporary electric fencing is 3 eighths of an inch fiber rod post that are coated and UV stabilized. And when we're looking at the equipment, you'll see why. You also need some big fat fiber rod post, but the ones that are coated and UV stabilized are super expensive. So instead of buying those, buy gloves. And then you have step-in post, which you think, well, those are really easy. I'll just use all step-in posts till the ground gets dry and they won't step in. Um, or it gets really hot and they bend over. But you do need step-in post. And then I'll repeat, do not use your post to hold up the twine. Don't wrap the damn twine around the post and because it looks like it's up, but the, the twine can't move. And that will cause breakage and all kinds of unhappiness in the long run. Now, how should you do your spacing on your posts? Well, there's no one answer to that. 
because it depends on how uneven your ground is. If you've got lots of up and down, you've got to put your posts close together. Make sure you put one on the up and one on the down. If it's a nice flat field, you can put them as far apart as you think you can snooker the animals into believing that they're held in by. The other thing for me is if you're putting up a fence like a horse fence, like we move the horses a lot. So we just put in, and horses are good with electric fence. Once they know, they mostly, you'll get a horse that'll go, hmm, I don't think that fence is on every so often. But mostly horses are pretty good, so you can put your posts further apart. Now you put your posts really close together, but you're still only got a string out there. So putting posts really close together doesn't necessarily make the fence any stronger. It just makes the fence so it's harder for the animal <coughs> to get curious and maybe go underneath it. All right, the other thing is, is that when you put the, your fence up three miles from the house, you don't want to have to go back and fix that fence very often. So you tend to be a little more conservative about how far apart you put your post. So those are the things that I use to decide how wide my post spacing should be. How long is the fence going to be up? How broken is the train? How risky is it that animals are going to want to go through it, and how far is it from the shop? So if I have to go back, because I want to reduce the chance that I'm going to have to go back and fix it. Okay, now insulators are the little widgets that go on top of the posts to hold the string up. And they make about 25 billion kinds of insulators. I brought one today to show you that's a cheap one. It works fine. I have reasons that I like it. But I, if I'd been 100% smart today, I would have brought you another one that's a lot more expensive that works better. But insulators, you tend to lose them. You need to be able to move them up and down if you're going to drive over the fence, which you end up doing if you've got lots of fence. And the other thing that's super important is you want that fence wire to be as high as possible. So when the deer run through it, they're running under it. And they will. I've seen them at a dead run running under a fence. But you have to be able to adjust where that wire is going to be. And if you have step-in posts, the wire is going to go where the step-in post stops. So I like insulators because you can push them down and drive over them. And you can raise them up really high to keep the deer and antelope from ruining your fence all the time. All right. Okay, so handles are what you use to break the fence without ruining the electrical current so you can go through it. They're often used for gates and they're often used at either end of a fence. There's such a thing as a hot handle which will carry the current and a cold handle which is just an insulator. So like if you've got electric fence and you want to hook it to barbed wire fence, you use a cold handle. And if you've got a hot if you want to connect two fences together or you for some reason don't want to break the current and I'll show you why in a little bit you use did I say cold or hot now I've got myself confused um, you want a cold handle to go to barbed wire and you want a hot handle when you don't want to break the current and then when you make your end gates you want to use a handle. Sometimes you want to use a handle, and next to that, you want to use a pigtail or a heavy post. And I'll, th this will all make a little more sense in a minute, I hope. Okay, now all fences need gates, right? And there's two kinds of gates that you typically use with temporary electric fence. One is a bungee gate, and I'll show you one here in a little bit. And real common is a twine gate, which is basically just the end of your electric fence that you if you, if you have a lot of confidence in who's going to be using the fence, you can just unhook the whole doggone fence. If you don't, you need to make a gate there. And I'll show you that here in a second. And you need some kind of gate post if your fence is going to be up for some time. Okay, now a little bit about the chargers. The charger has to be sized for the length of the fence. If you have a little weenie charger like the one I brought today to show you, and you've got a, a mile of fence. I don't care if it says 15 miles on the charger. If you've got l like a quarter mile or a, maybe a half mile, you can use a little charger. If you've got more, you need a bigger charger. 
Now we have a bunch of those heavy chargers with the marine batteries in that you can barely move. And those are really good chargers, but they're not very mobile. And we use those for our electric fence. It's a, like a mile long. The charger's pretty critical because if you don't have a good charge on the fence, you're not communicating what you want to communicate with your animals. What you want to see on your tester that reads numbers is you want to see 4,000 volts or more. What you really love is a fence that's 5.6 or 6.4. You've got to have those numbers because a fence can be hot at 2.8, but it's not going to cut a lot of ice with an animal that, that really doesn't want to be there anymore. So you re need to be able to read the numbers. If your fence isn't above four, tinker with it to see if you can get it better because um, less than four is kind of iffy in my mind. Solar panels, the little solar chargers, are they're a gift. We really use them a lot. We've got five or six different kinds. But if you can plug into power, that's even better because you can get a much hotter fence. So when you're running around your house, use a charger you can plug in. Now, they still make chargers, fence electrifiers that are not solar and they work perfectly fine if you hook them up to a battery. You just got to go out and change the battery. We have a little charger that runs off of D-cells. It works perfectly good, especially for horses, but the, the batteries wear out and then you have to change them. The nice thing about solar is that you can put it out and as long as the battery inside of it doesn't wear down or something doesn't happen to it, it'll just be out there doing its job with no problem forever. So solar chargers are really great that way. And the chargers have leads. They have a hot lead that goes to the fence and they have a ground lead that goes to the ground. Calves love to tinker with those things. And it's sometimes a good idea to use electrical tape to tape the leads on. All of this, if you don't know anything about fencing at all, is like, what, what? But it, and, and so that's why most of this little talk is with the materials. But taping on the clips to your fence is, a, is not a bad idea, and it's a little tip that nobody ever tells you. Okay. Okay, now to grounding. And what I told you a little bit earlier is lodge grass is the best place I've ele ever electric fence because it's got a kind of clay there that holds moisture. And then it holds the moisture close to the ground rod. And that is what you have to have to have an effective ground. I fenced in Mexico for a while in the desert and it's an uphill battle because it's so dang dry. There's nothing to suck that power, that electricity into the ground and disperse it. And so you have a lot of trouble with grounding. North of Gillette is the same way. The ground gets so dry that you don't have a good ground. So what does that mean? The ground is what takes the power and puts it down into the ground and disperses it. To do that, the ground has to be damp or the ground rods have to be really beefy. And what they'll tell you if you buy a, a grounds, which you'll usually have to, is that you need these six foot ground rods and you need them 10 feet apart and you need three of them and you need to tie them all together with twine and then you hook your ground to that. And that's true. Over north of Gillette, that's what we use for our grounds. Here in Lodgegrass, we can clip them onto the barbed wire fence and it works fine. Or we can use a little ground rod about this long that we pound into the ground and it works fine too. So I can't tell you what's going to work at your place because it depends. But if your ground is dry or your ground is sandy, like in the sand hills, we got a lot of rain, but the ground is so sandy that it didn't hold the earth close to the ground rod and so you had to use three ground rods. So it depends a, a lot but a good general rule is if you can put your ground rod where the ground stays damp like down one gentleman said people were swiping his charger. Well the charger has to be where the ground rod is and if you can put them someplace where everybody and their cousin can't see your charger when they drive by which sometimes is in a draw that also has the advantage that it's damper, the ground's damper. So if you have damp ground that makes your ground better, your ground rod more effective. So the simple answer to what makes a good ground is dampness. 
And if you don't have dampness, then you need lots more ground rod. I guess that's the best way to look at that. And that's what it means there. The drier the ground, and I'm being a little confusing because I'm talking about the ground is the thing that makes the fence work, and also the ground is the stuff that you pound the ground into. So to, the ground has to go into the ground in order to ground the fence. If the ground's damp or it's good soil that holds the soil against the ground rod, then that means you don't need as much. But we do have a place on lodge grass where we put, two places where we put in those six foot ground rods, 10 feet apart, all connected with wire, because we thought that we needed a good ground, but that wasn't the problem in the fence. So, so it's not always the ground's fault. It often is the twine's fault if you don't have a good fence, and we'll see this. All right, now we'll talk about how to install temporary electric fence. Number one to my mind is, is there anybody in here that folds all their socks and puts them in the drawer the same way or hangs all their shirts up the same way? If you're that kind of person, you'll be a pretty good electric fencer. But if you're the kind of person that just is a little higgledy-piggledy, please try and realize that it's really important to get organized before you start. Because there's nothing more annoying than being three miles from the house and going, Where's my fencing pliers? So get organized before you start. I recommend that you use a side-by-side -side for transportation, because it can a side-by-side -side four-wheeler, because you can get just about any place, but it's big enough to put all your room for materials. And believe me, when it's 100 degrees, the little roof on your side-by-side -side is really nice for protection. Or when it's 10 degrees below zero, which you can still fence in, it gives you a little bit of cover. Now the next thing is, you got twine, you got post. You're a guy, so you think, I gotta be able to do this a really clever way. And you might be right, but I'm here to tell you that you've gotta go up the fence, down the fence, up the fence, and down the fence to put in the line, to put in the post, to energize the charger. You just can't get away from it, and you can use electric reels and you can do all kinds of clever stuff but you got to pull the fence out you got to walk back and pound in the post you got to walk back to your vehicle you got to drive back to your chart your charger what you want for efficiency is not to do any more than that so you don't go you don't walk out and you go oh where's my hammer or you don't walk out and you go oh I this post doesn't have an insulator on it or you don't want to pull the wire out with your four-wheeler and then realize you've wrapped it around your axle. All that stuff happens all the time. You're trying to maximize your efficiency, but you can't maximize it past up the fence, down the fence, up the fence to get your vehicle, and down the fence to charge it. You just can't. My suggestion is that you use a mix of fiber rod post and pigtail post. And we'll see in a minute that the pigtail post, you can't change the elevation of the wire, but when somebody goes through that fence, the pigtail post help keep the wire from falling down on the ground, which is pretty handy when you got miles and miles of wire. If your fence is flat, like on your fields, if the fencing is flat, you want to insulate, you want your insulators to be every other, huh, I can't say this right, your insulators all shouldn't face in the same direction. You want one this way and one that way, one this way, one that way, so if something hits the fence, the likelihood of them pulling the whole twine halfway down the field is, is somewhat less. You, what you want is, otherwise, you want the insulators to push against the strain of the fence. So if you're kind of going around the curve, you don't want the wire to be able to pop off so easily. That's a pretty important thing for installation, and I don't think I explained it very well. But here's how I do most of my fencing. I pull the twine, like I hold the twine reel, and I drive along, and I look to make sure I'm not wrapping the damn twine around the axle. Or I hang it on the four-wheeler, and I drive along real slowly, listening to make sure it's unreeling, so that I don't get 100 feet and the twine has broken because it it wasn't unreeling. But I use the vehicle lots of times. Now if you're in super rough ground you can't do that or if you're 
going around a sharp curve, you can't do that. But that's a good general way to do it. You can get yourself in a lot of angry trouble that way, but it's a pretty fast way. Then what I do, I pull the twine out, I set the handle, and then I carry just the number of posts that I can carry comfortably. And believe me, you'll say, oh, well, maybe I can use a golf bag, or maybe I can use a wheelbarrow, or maybe I can do this, or maybe I can, do, maybe I can use a quiver. I've always thought that might be a good idea. But what I always do is I carry about the number of posts I can carry, and then when I've pounded them in, I walk back and get the vehicle, and I drive forward. Now you can say, but look, you've done all that walking. True, but you can't get away from it. You've got to go up and down and up and down. No matter how you do it, whether you go up and down the whole fence once, or you go up and down it in little increments as you drive along it. So I pull the twine, I walk back, and I set my post, and when I run out of post, and between every post, I put all the posts on the ground. And then I pick them up again. Down, up, down, up. And you say, well, that's not very efficient, and maybe it won't be for you, but it's the best way for me. And if you spend too much time monkeying around with your posts, like you drop them instead of putting them down, or you try and hold them while you're trying to pound in the post, those are all things that waste your time. And what you really want to be in electric fencing is efficient as possible. And then when I've got all my posts in, then I set my charger, I electrify the fence, I clip on the clips and I turn it on. Oh, it's such a relief. And then I test it. And I test it and it's 2.8. And I throw the charger, the tester on the ground. And then I go back and I find that I somehow got the wire wrapped around something or something's wrong with it. Or I test it and it says 5.6. And I'm so happy just for a minute because we've got a fence that works really good. So that's basically how we do it. Pull the twine, pound the post back, set the charger, turn it on, and test it. The other thing is when you're working outside a lot, you need to take a lot of water. And it's like none of my business if you're thirsty. But it's very easy to get very dehydrated when you're doing this work in the field. And the other thing is, is if you've got a lot of water and your ground's kind of dry, you can pound in your ground rod and then pour water around it and that'll dampen the ground up and it'll give you about half a, uh, half a kilovolt. So it's worth it to have lots of water. Okay, now look. Here is an electric fence post. And there's another one and there's another one. And this is a good layout for fence. This is your gate, and this is your fence. And there's lots of posts in between. But the idea is, if you're going to have a fence up for any length of time, and somebody other than you, like the neighbor, or your ranch hand, or your spouse, or your children, are going to go through that gate, if you don't have a separate gate post, I can guarantee you they'll leave the fence down, and something will come along and get tangled up in it. So it's pretty helpful to have a big, more beefier gate post and to have that gate post in a perfect world not connected to the rest of the fence. Because why? Because when the person drives through it and leaves it open, the rest of the fence stays hot. So that means you have to have a charger at either end. And it's stupid to waste a charger for just the gate. So this works the best when you've got another fence going the other way. But generally speaking, even if you have to keep the whole line hot from one charger, which is what you do 90% of the time, having a good gate post there is really, really, really useful. Okay, now you put all this stuff up, and now you take it down. And what you do is you're in a hurry, you take it down as fast as you can, throw it in the back of the four-wheeler, and then the next time you need to find your sand hammer, you can't find it because you didn't take it down in an organized way. So once again, I'll say you got to be organized. And the other thing I'll say is that you're going to go up and you're going to go down and you're going to go up and you're going to go down. There's not hardly any way to get around it. Although you can drive along and pull your post and throw them in the back and try and reel up the twine all at once too. Don't. Just don't try that. But it really <laughs> doesn't, it doesn't save you any time. The most likely thing that happens to you when you're reeling up twine is there's no tension on your twine and you wrap the twine around the axle, the outside axle of your reel. 
So try and use the same thing the same way. Don't try and pick up all the posts and carry them in your arms. Just pick up about 10 of them and lay them down and then when you drive up in the four-wheeler you can pick them up and keep them separated. Keep the pigtail separated from the fiber rods so then when you put them in again you're not trying to separate them. Keep tension on the twine when you reel. I can't say how important this is. It doesn't have to be a lot of tension. If you've got half a mile of twine out, you'll be lucky if you can reel it up, much less worry about do you have tension on it. But if, you, if it's loose, it'll wrap up funky, and then it won't unwrap very well. So have tension on the twine. Take the twine out of the insulators before you roll it up because you're bound to have knots in your twine that you put there yourself. Whoops, I just pounded on my microphone. Um, and if you don't take it out of the insulators, you'll pop the insulators off when you reel it up. Watch the reel and don't get to wool gathering because you'll look down and find you've wrapped your twine outside your reel. And try not to drag the twine. If you're putting, and this is especially true for when you're doing fields, small fields, it's such a temptation to just drag the twine to the next place. And it works pretty good. But if you do it, you're almost always dragging it around a post. And you can actually cut a post in half with electric fence twine. So try to resist the temptation to drag your twine very much. But sometimes it's by far the best thing to do. And then I say again, keep your materials organized. All right. Now, here's a really thing if you work with electric fence. These are 10 rules that I really hope you remember. And the number one rule is your fence has to be hot. I don't care if you're going to leave it out in the field, it has to be hot because if it's not hot, it's just a twine. Anything can get through it. So don't turn the charger off. Don't rob the charger and take it someplace else. Don't partially take down the fence and say you'll get to it later. Keep your fence up and hot. If your fence is laying on the ground, something will get tangled up in it and it can cripple them. It'll cripple a calf if it gets twi twirled up in the twine. It'll kill a baby antelope if it gets twirled up in the twine. Keep your fence hot. Keep it up. Don't start to take it down and come back tomorrow, which is really three weeks later. Keep the fence twine high on the post as you possibly can. Now you say, but the calves can get under it. Well, if you've got a cow-calf pair, fine, let the calves out. They'll come. You think they're not going to come back? They come back to their mothers. If the fence twine is high on the post, the deer that run, will run under it and so will the antelope. The antelope aren't too smart, but they will run under the twine if it's high enough. A cow in the winter time when it's got really thick fur will maybe slip under a fence twine but mostly 99% of the time those cows won't go anywhere near that twine. You can't get them to come through a twine if you beg them. Keep it hot. Keep it up. Keep it high on the post. Keep your gate shut because we all know that a fence with an open gate is nothing but a wire storage location. A fence with an open gate is not a fence. It's just as true for electric fence as it is for any other kind of fence. Keep your fence tested. I've been married for 35 years, and if I've heard once, I've heard a million times, oh, the fence is hot because it made a spark. Oh, the fence is hot because I touched it with a screwdriver. Don't, don't go there. Use your tester. Your fence will come down. Something will go through it. There'll be a windstorm. The wild horses will go through it, and your fence will come down, and it'll be broken. When you put your fence back up, you have to test it at both ends because your wire is likely damaged and you'll have to do some debugging to find where it's broken. But the other thing is, is you go, well, I got 10 miles of fence out there. I can't go out and check my fence every time. That's right, and you don't have to. You need to check your fence with your tester in the same place at about the same time of day about once a week 
And if the fence started out at 4.2 and it stays at 4.2, it's up. Don't worry. But if you test it and all of a sudden it's gone from 4.2 down to 3.6, it's not because it got tired. Something happened to the fence, and that's when you have to drive along and check it. So the tester with the numbers is a really good way to check and make sure your fence is up. Okay, it's checked. Quality. If you use crappy materials, you're going to have crappy results. There's no way around it. So you've got to pick and choose what you want good quality. But I'm sorry to tell you this is $110, and it's worth every penny of it. Consistence. All right. Don't sometimes put your insulators on one way and another time put them on another way. Don't sometimes use this kind of pose. Don't sometimes put them 10 feet apart and sometimes 50. Do the same thing every time. Why? Because it's faster. Consistence means efficiency. So develop your little method however you're going to do it and just do the same thing over and over and over. Be organized. How much time does it take when you're looking for your tester? Because sometimes you put it in the glove box and sometimes you put it in your pocket and sometimes you put it in your toolbox and sometimes you leave it at home. Don't, don't. Be organized. And the other thing is maintain your equipment. If it doesn't work right, you're wasting your time. Those are the top 10 rules. And on your tests that you're going to get at the end of the day, I'm going to say, what are the 10 words? And they're hot, up, high, shut, tested, check, quality, consistency, organization, and maintenance. You can remember those. And if you can't, just remember hot. That's good enough. There they are. Hot, up, high, shut, tested, check, quality, consistency, organization, maintenance. Just, just that. But if you go, I can't remember 10 words, just remember one, hot. That'll help. Okay, so what's going to hurt your fence? Here's your challenges. Cows. A cow that learns that a fence isn't hot will always be going through it. The first time a cow checks your fence, she's got to get zapped. That means don't bother to put up a 2.8 fence. All you'll do is create problems for yourself. Calves. We wean our calves with electric fence. Calves will respect fence. But they can go back and forth underneath a fence in the summertime. There's no problem with that. You don't have to keep the calves in if you've got their mothers. They're not going to go away. Bulls. Bulls will respect electric fence. They're really good with electric fence. You can keep a cow in season at a bull wanting to get to her away with a little tiny piece of twine as long as it's hot. But if the bulls get to fighting, they'll push each other through. That's not their fault. They're not testing the fence. It got distracted by the fight. So you got to be prepared for that. Horses. Horses really, as a general rule, really respect electric fence. In fact, they get, can get so spooky that you can't get them near it. So you don't really want them zapped except the first time. Wild horses are the same, but if you've got a herd of 20 wild horses running on your place that have never come up against electric fence, I guarantee you they're going to break it. So after they broke it though, they won't go through it again. So every time you get a new set of wild horses on your, in your pasture, you can expect that your fence is going to be broken and snarled in a mess, but once you get it back up again, it'll be all right. The deer and antelope, you put your fence high so that they can go under the fence. A bear can get wrapped up in your fence, and that's a problem. It'll break, he'll break it. In fact, we had one wrap a post around a tree, I mean, a metal post. So I've heard that grizzly bears uh, respect electric fence because they've got hollow hairs, but that could be an alligator in the sewer kind of myth, so I'm not backing it. A turkey will get caught in your fence, especially if it's not hot. So back to the always keep your fence hot. The neighbors. If you're having a fight with your neighbor, or he hates electric fence, or he's lazy, or and we're not lazy, only our neighbors are lazy, of course. But if for any reason, or he's in a hurry, or he's never touched electric fence before, they'll leave your fence open. Just, it's just going to happen. 
So that's one of the reasons you need to check your fence every so often. Your ranch hands, alas, may have a very different opinion of electric fence. Now, Ellie's really good, but we've had ranch hands in the past that really hate electric fence, and they will do their best to make it not work so they don't have to use it. And your spouse, no matter how much more they know than you do, and no matter how long they've worked with the fence, they will do it different than you. So you kind of got to make your fence worm proof against all these challenges. And the way you do that is you be consistent in the way you put it up, you use good materials, you check your fence. Now that all seems like a lot of work. But remember, what are you gunning for? You're gunning for a 30% increase in your production. And no matter how much your electric fence costs, I can guarantee you it's not going to cost $1,000 an acre like ranch land does. So it's like getting a 30% bigger ranch with some pretty moderate input. So it's worth it, but it's not going to jump up and do it itself. It's some work, I'm sorry to say. Okay. So blah, 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 that's all I told you, long talk here. What I want to do now is I want to show you the stuff I brought. Then I want to show you a few knots of how to make some knots. And then I want to give you your little test. But for right now, I'm going to say, what time is it? And how much time do we have left? About an hour left. Perfect. All right. So everybody take a stretch. And in three minutes, we'll come and we'll start right here with that twine reel on the end. <laughs> 